There we go. Hello, and welcome to our webinar. Um, our special guest, Dr. Tom Tolley, will be with us in a moment. Um, so let's wait a little bit, let people log in so we can all get on the webinar together. And in the meantime, I thought, who doesn't like a poll? Especially who doesn't like a poll about birds? So this is my first time trying the, the poll uh, option on here. Um, let's see how this goes. Across some of my fingers, uh, I'm going to launch the poll. And I want you all to answer if you can. Answer honestly, because what's the purpose of a poll if you don't answer honestly? All right. So uh, which best describes your bird at the vet? My bird loves the personal attention. My bird tolerates the personal attention. My bird has to be extracted from the travel carrier. Uh, have the towel ready because my bird, oops, sorry. Oh, my bird, it got cut off. My bird is ready to rumble. So the birds, <laughs> you know, the birds that might not like all the personal attention. That last question is, sorry, it got cut off. But uh, have the towel ready because my bird is ready to rumble. Um, and by the way, I don't know about you, but I am always impressed when I go to the vet on how effortlessly they can tell a bird. I wish I was as inept, adept at that as they are. So kudos to you guys for being able to handle birds so well. Um, ooh, okay. So I'm gonna give time for people to answer these questions. Sorry about the last question. It's cut off in case you're just joining us, but it does say have the towel ready because my bird is ready to rumble. Um, it's a kind of a, it's a, actually an interesting mixture of answers so far. Really? Yeah. I will end the poll in about a, let me see here. Let me give it another, uh, another go for people to be logging in. But um, so far we have a good bit of, ooh, there's a, my bird tolerates the attention is now taking the lead. That's good. That's yeah. good. I like and, those. Yeah. <laughs> Those are my favorite patients. I'm sure you've had a couple of my uh, get towel ready because my bird is ready to rumble. I know my Amazon was like that. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to give us another 10 seconds. Everybody get their answers in. And I'm going to end the poll and see what the results are. Okay, here we go. End poll. Ah. Can you guys all, I'm going to share the results here. Okay. So, um, well, we do have some people whose bird loves the attention. Um, that's good. <laughs> and nice to see that some birds tolerate the uh, personal attention. They must be knowing that you're, you brought them in because you love and care about them. Um, uh, my bird loves to, has to be extracted from the travel carrier. I don't blame them. Because it is a new, it is an experience that's a little bit something they don't have every day. And then have a towel ready because my bird is ready to rumble. Yeah, they are, they are a, you know, prey species. So you can't blame them for that. Um, well, even if you practice fear free, which we all try to make it as fear free as possible and always have, uh, we do have most of the owners are there right away and saying, my bird bites. So they at least prepare us to, to be careful. And uh, I appreciate that. And, uh, and I do realize and, uh, that they do, do bite from time to time and, and that it is, uh, it is somewhat of a, uh, an unusual and, and, and scary situation for them. So we do everything possible with that um, and, and try to make it. And there have been many advances uh, even with some of the sedation to try to reduce the, um, I, I guess, the, the, the scary experience for the, the birds. So well, there you go. So when you take your birds to that, if you give them a, a, give them a little bit of a heads up on, on how your bird might be with the, with the visit. All right. So I'm going to close the poll. Thank you guys for answering that. And, um, so I've, hopefully we have everybody on. Um, so I'm gonna kickstart this, uh, this webinar. So welcome. Um, my name is Laura Doring. I'll be the host today. Uh, and our webinar is Ask the Vet, a Q&A with Dr. Tolley, Dr. Tom Tolley. So just to, since we are doing a lot of Q&A um, during this webinar, a reminder to, to um, use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. 
um, not the chat button, but the Q&A. So we want the questions coming in through the Q&A option so we can keep a better um, hold on that because I'm sure we'll get some uh, good, get a good amount of questions today. Um, and if your question isn't answered today, uh, still we, we, will, um, we will capture that information and you will be getting a link to your question with a reply. We, do, um, we are able to capture that and email you an answer um, at, a, at, a, at a later time. So uh, we will get to hopefully uh, most questions that are, answered, that are asked today. Um, so now on to our guest, um, Dr. Tom Tolley. He is a professor in the Veterinary um, Clinical Sciences Department and Section Chief of the Bird, Zoo, the Bird, Zoo, and Exotic Animal Service at Louisiana State University, LSU, uh, School of Veterinary Medicine. Dr. Tolley is a diplomat of the American Board of Veterinary Practitioners, Avian, and the European College of Zoological Medicine, Avian. He is also a recipient of the TJ Lefebvre Practitioner of the Year Award. So that is saying a lot right there. Um, so Dr. Tolley, thanks for being on with us today and um, welcome. And let's, let's see what you have to say. If you can give us a little bit um, intro about you know, basic bird care, about what to expect on vet visits, and then we'll dive into Q&As. Okay, <clears throat> well, thank you very much, Laura. And, and it's a pleasure to be here and talking to everybody uh, about um, bird care and to try to answer some questions that you may have. Uh, and I always am trying to do everything possible to inform and educate um, the uh, bird owner to try to make it a, what I would consider a, a, a great uh, environment and experience for both the bird and the owner. And the more information that you, you have, uh, the better chance you have of uh, providing a, an environment uh, for that, that bird and also, or birds, and, and that would include uh, nutrition to, so that 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 animal or those animals can live long, happy, and healthy lives. Uh, it's all about education and information, and if you ever have any questions, you need to, to ask, uh, and it's always good to ask a knowledgeable source. I always say that I, I enjoy and I encourage all of my uh, bird owners uh, or the uh, birds that I see to to get as much education and information as possible. Um, I, I encourage uh, those owners to uh, seek the internet. The internet's a great resource. Um, that's, uh, and then what, if you don't understand or if you question what you may see, and then that's where you should ask uh, possibly a health professional, your veterinarian, or somebody that may know uh, in particular about that uh, um, particular issue that you uh, have a question about. A uh, couple of things that I want to start off this, this webinar with is some of the information and some of the more common, um, I guess, issues that we've seen and problems that are associated with uh, the patients that, uh, that we treat here at LSU. Uh, one is nutrition. Uh, nutrition is extremely important. Uh, it's like what you eat is what you are. Um, and it also helps maintain not only the health of the animal, but also the future health and the longevity of, of that, that uh, animal itself. And so that could also relate to reproductive activity if you're seeking to, to reproduce those, those uh, birds always think uh, diversity. You always want to have a diverse diet. I think that the diverse diet and when you're looking at that, you're, you're thinking um, and, and providing a psychological benefits uh, with a, a diverse diet. Also foraging. Foraging is also a psychological activity that stimulates that bird above and beyond the nutritional intake that bird has. So uh, there's many aspects about nutrition that are above and beyond just uh, putting the, the, the food in the, the, the um, enclosure. And so uh, one of the 
um, the first things that I, I had and, and kind of kind of gave me some ideas of what the the birds uh, can do I, and as it relates to nutrition and how it benefits those birds through only uh, not only uh, the diversity but also the foraging uh, I was down in Puerto Rico and and uh, they had the it was at the Puerto Rican Amazon uh, reproductive uh, facility uh, where they're trying to uh, breed these birds to put more of those Puerto Rican Amazons back into the wild and replenish the population that has diminished over the years. And I was looking at the diet and the diet was very diverse, very diverse. Uh, and one of it was they had these, these Amazon parrots that weigh about 300 grams. And within the, and they, and they had specifically the seed mixture that they were providing them. And they were not only providing them seed, but they had a pelleted mixture. <clears throat> they had pellets and they had, they had vegetables. And of course, in Puerto Rico, you can have all of these tropical fruits that grow right outside of the, the place and, and <clears throat> the aviary. And so they had millet seed. And I said, millet seed, a 300 gram Amazon and the the, the, the person who was the caretaker of the aviary said yes, and the, and the birds eat the millet seed. And so it was one of those things that if the birds will eat, you have to, uh, with this, like a seed mixture, they're gonna eat what they like. I can tell you my derby and parrot, if I had a, a seed mixture, he had his favorite seeds that he would eat uh, out of that mixture wouldn't go to the pellets first. He didn't go like say, oh, I want that, that red pellet. That's what I want first. No, he would go to the seed mixture, but after he would eat the seeds, then he would eat the pellets. So uh, each bird is a little bit different, but it's that diversity. And you can see that with a, uh, it's both psychological and nutritional. Also, when you have health exams, people say, well, I'm gonna go and get my bird examined. Um, it could be a health exam just on a basic, I've never had the bird examined before, it's a new bird, or uh, there may be a particular problem. Well, what we can look at on a health exam is external abnormalities or normal, normal condition. That's all we can see externally. We cannot see anything internally unless we do other diagnostic tests. The death diagnostic tests have to be specific in what you're looking for to try to determine the overall health of that animal. So if I'm trying to see what's going on inside, if there's no fracture or there's no mass or something, there's really, no need for me to do radiographic imaging or any type of advanced imaging, diagnostic imaging, but it's the same as if you go into your physician and you get a physical exam. The physical exam, the physician may look at you and feel and say, you know, take your heart rate and listen to your heart, your lungs, but what's at the end of that exam? Oh, you have to go get some blood taken. Why do they take the blood? Because the blood will show them what's going on inside. So a physical exam is not complete unless you have blood testing. And that tells what's going on inside of the patient. Now, you can get by with not doing it, but there will possibly be chances that there's a significant, there's something missing. Can tell you one example of this, Hyacinth McCaw. Uh, Hyacinth McCaw went in for a physical exam. Bird looked great, looked great. Physical exam included blood work. Well, the normal red blood cells within the uh, bird is usually about 50% of the blood volume, about 50%. This bird had 12%. So it was what we call anemic, low red blood cells. And it's 12% is very close to not being 
really where you have, uh, you can function and possibly die. If that blood test was not taken, there'd have been no clue what was going on with the bird and it would have, it would have died. I could, I could tell you, it would have died if something wasn't done for that bird but it would nobody would have known anything because the bird looked perfectly good so i always say if you want to really know what's going on about with your bird when you take it in for a physical exam it needs to have uh, blood diagnostic testing at least a complete blood count also what we we see <clears throat> is is where we have a lot of the backyard poultry uh, waterfowl and birds that are that are outside and uh, many times it's like you go uh, oh well we treat this this bird for we always treat our birds for parasites and so we treat them for parasites on a, a regular basis we use you know the parasite killer drug kills all of them unfortunately for parasites um, one size doesn't fit all. You know, each parasite is sensitive to a specific drug. So if you give one drug, it may treat a certain parasite, but it's not going to treat, let's say you have uh, worms in the, you have round worms uh, in the, the, the bird. And for birds, capillaria is a, is a common uh, worm that you have, parasite in birds, but it's not gonna treat if they have tapeworms or if they have some other type of parasite. So parasite, anti-parasitic medication has to be specific. And so that's why if you have birds that treating with a anti-parasitic medication on a regular basis, um, to me is a, a waste of time, money, and, and labor, and that it's easier and probably a lot less expensive to get routine fecal examinations to see if there's any parasites there, and if there are parasites there, to treat them specifically uh, for those parasites with the specific drug that's uh, needed on there. Um, also, we have our share of behavioral issues. Um, behavioral issues, I would say, with parrot species is one of the most challenging uh, cases that we, we do see. First and foremost, we want to make sure if this behavioral issue is associated with any medical issue, any disease condition. Uh, we have to do our due diligence that it is, in fact, a, <clears throat> a medical issue. Um, I have been told before uh, by an owner uh, when I went through this whole process, it was a, um, I think it was a yellow collared macaw, and it was a few years ago, and uh, the bird had plucked all of its feathers from the neck, you know, down. And so it, I went in and I said, well, uh, we, we need to see why the bird is, is plucking the feathers out and we're gonna need to examine it and, and, and see uh, why, why it's doing that. And if we can treat it medically, then we, we don't have to say and assume that it's a behavior issue. Well, the owner said, well, Dr. Tully, yeah, we know why it pulled its feathers out. And I wish that every time somebody brought in a bird that they would say, we know what's wrong with it. We just need to treat it. And so I said, well, what happened? And they said, well, you know, about six months ago, they, 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 had, a, they had the bird for a number of years and everybody was happy and the bird was happy and so, they brought home their baby from the hospital. And they said they brought home the baby and the next day the bird's feathers were all plucked out. And I said, well, that was six months ago. Well, we brought home, a, and he said, well, the one thing is, is that the bird well, used, got used to the baby and, 
the feathers grew back, but last night we brought home a dog. And so <clears throat> there, there was an, an, an issue with this, obviously with this bird, where there was a cause and effect. Anytime they would bring somebody into their house that they did, the bird was not aware was coming in and nobody got its permission, it would just pluck out its feathers. So we had to deal with that. The behavioral issues are, are difficult because it's not always that simple. Um, and sometimes even when it's very obvious of what's causing it, it's about how do you resolve that. That's why we have veterinary behaviorists and avian behaviorists that really try to work and make you understand what some of these issues are where you don't have this uh, medication that you can give and the, the bird gets better automatically. And, and so behavior issues are difficult. And as with anything, it's always better if you have behavioral issues to try to do every, or, or behavioral issues can be a problem that you do everything you can in the beginning to try to prevent those behavioral issues from occurring. And that goes for, in cockatoos, we have um, cloacal prolapse, uh, where we believe that there is uh, too close of a relationship between that bird and the owner, and that that relationship, um, I, I, what we would say, encourages that bird to do um, behavioral um, issue, have behavioral con conditions that result in that bird prolapsing the cloaca and then changing the behavior of both the owner and the bird are, are difficult, are difficult. And, um, and, and so it just kind of continues. And then you have also anatomical issues that are associated with it that make it difficult to, to, to fix. So anything that you can do to prevent the issues from occurring, be aware of what some of the behavioral concerns are, making sure that the bird is uh, psychologically stimulated. We talked a little bit about that with nutrition, but also that you can do that in, in a number of ways um, to, to encourage that bird to, to be um, happy and, and also uh, reduce the incidence of uh, abnormal behavior. So it, it sounds like, Dr. Tully, that um, uh, another part of bringing of your bird's health is, is um, making perhaps lifestyle changes that on your behalf and lifestyle changes that might uh, benefit your bird. So it's not just um, like uh, the situation with the cockatoo, like maybe, maybe not making it more of a less of a Velcro type situation. Velcro bird, you know, with cockatoos is a typical mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. moniker that they get. But um, to kind of see it as, as not just a, a, the physical um, presentation, but the emotional, the lifestyle changes, just like it is with us, right? Right. And, and <clears throat> one of the things, what, what I always try to, and, and, one, and, and, to, and to speak of the cockatoo, uh, I always, always like the term, and I think I heard Chris Davis say this uh, many, many years ago, and call the cockatoo a cockatoma. <laughs> that they want to be physically attached to your body like a tumor, you know, that's a, a cockatoma. And, and so I've never forgot that. Uh, and and uh, they've lived up to that uh, name over the years. But uh, one thing, Laura, is that I always tell the owner that uh, you need to work with the bird to have the bird uh, fit your lifestyle um, and, and not have the bird train you and to train you into a, a situation where you're doing what you um, don't want to do or that it's, it's overbearing for you. And birds will train you in a second. Birds have an ability to train you and make you do what they want you to do. And you have to be 
the person that is <laughs> or the you know the the owner you have as the owner you have to be the boss and you have to work to train the bird how you want the bird to behave and that's operant behavior training in making the bird do what you want it to do but it's happy to do it because it thinks it's doing what it wants to do but actually you're training the bird and so that's how they get um, animals to come up and and uh, um, put out their uh, like primates to put out their arm to collect blood or 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 uh, dolphins uh, porpoises to put out their flipper to collect blood because they train them that way and birds can be trained this way birds can be clicker trained that's been known and so you know you can get uh, and they're smart they're smart animals and i think uh, you may have had dr pepperberg or whatever uh, or, or some other behaviorist on this uh, before but the, the intelligence we know what the intelligence are that's why they can train us because they they're smart but we have to take the upper hand and be able to train them so that when we train them that um, that everybody's happy within the house because if if an owner isn't happy with the bird and getting the most out of the bird and the companionship qualities that they seek then that's not good good point good point um wow i'm going to move on to the uh i think we'll move on to some of the questions we've got i, I see them popping up here um those are very good points though um that we can all learn something from i think that's very valid um so we have a question from, let me see here. Uh, get the name on here. Okay, Maria asks, um, should imaging of the, oh boy, I hope I don't miss uh, the words here, <laughs> first pronunciate. Um, should imaging of the colonial papillae be a standard part of avian, uh, an avian exam in order to check for vitamin A status? Only one out of four avian vets I've seen has checked the the coanal uh, papilla. Thank you for mm -hmm. blunting. And I know it's not a mainstream practice, but is there a strong evidence for the appearance of the coanal papillae reflecting hypovitaminosis A? Well, as as that should be part of a routine exam for a bird. Um, because this is not only a, an, an area that there's a, a claim uh, for hypovitaminosis A, um, but what the, and, and along with the coanal papilla, what, what we look for for hypovitaminosis A also is the bottom of the foot surface where you have, should have the little, little um, uh, foot foot pads uh, and, and it should be smooth and you, and you should have the little bumps on there that are typical of a, uh, of a parrot foot or a, or a bird foot, but in particular parrots. And so we look for that. If it's, if it's smooth, then that may be, or, or thickened, uh, that may be a, an indication of hypovitaminosis A. Um, my, you know, very rarely would I, and, and I can't even remember where I have seen a hypovitaminosis A bird uh, recently uh, with a blunted coanal papilla. But you look at that coana um, mainly, uh, you know, for upper respiratory conditions. And if there's a chronic upper respiratory condition, those coanal papilla will be, will be um, eroded or blunted and the coena uh, the, on the upper roof of the mouth, it's the oral nasal interface. And what that'll do is that with the irritation and uh, inflammation associated with the upper respiratory uh, condition, uh, will blunt those papilla and it will be inflamed and, and possibly uh, swollen. So, and, and just saw a bird uh, last week with that. Um, and, and it was, 
Um, not an obvious nasal discharge, but it did give me some indication that there was some chronicity and it did back up what the owner was seeing. And this is all part of a normal physical exam and it can tell you more than hypovitaminosis A and um, in, in particular um, upper respiratory infection. Okay, thank you. Um, I also have a question, let's see, from Nancy. She asks, please explain the difference between Bornavirus and what used to be called PDD. And what's the difference between Bor Borna ganglion neuritis and a diagnosis of ganglion neuritis? Well, um, very good, Laura. I I got I got the gist of that uh, for sure. I, I did I did, <laughs> but we'll we'll go with the ganglion neuritis, you know, and Thank that you. and and I and 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 Lord knows I have difficulty saying it myself. So so um, <clears throat> but um, at this point, what what is uh, you have uh, proventricular dilatation disease, and that can be identified. Um, if a bird is suspect uh, and dies from it, it can be, uh, you, you know, or dies from it, you can look at the pathology um, from a biopsy, um, which is easily, uh, is easiest done by a crop on a bird. Um, but uh, but in the, if a bird dies from it, you can see the pathology that's associated with the disease um, on the uh, necropsy. Uh, and they can look at the tissue sections just like they do a biopsy, but they have a better chance of looking at more tissue. And they can identify it and, and make a diagnosis based on the pathology. Um, at this, and Bornavirus comes into play because there is a suspect that this is, uh, has a, a role in the, the disease condition. There are birds that um, have uh, <clears throat> uh, died from uh, proventricular dilatation that have been diagnosed through pathology, that there was no evidence of Bornavirus being there. Um, and then there's birds that have not um, actually come down with the clinical condition or the disease condition of uh, proventricular dilatation disease that have been identified with Bornavirus. So how Bornavirus may or may not be involved in this, uh, at this point, we do not have all of the answers. And that's very typical with medicine, uh, as you can see with this COVID. Every day there's new new, um, um, I guess, um, ideas and, and, and information coming from uh, this, this coronavirus infection that we're dealing with now as a pandemic. It's the same with Bornavirus. We don't have everything, and, and, and for somebody to come out and, 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 and say we do, I think that's, that's, not, that's not, we're, you know, not totally true. Um, and I think that the, the more information that we get and uh, the more we'll be able to understand it. But um, at this point, there seems to be a connection. We just don't know, know uh, uh, what that, that connection is uh, at this point because many birds that do have proventricular dilatation have been um, identified with Bornavirus. Um, and so that's, that's my take uh, on that. Does that kind of answer the question? Well, I think it does. <laughs> that's what, <laughs> um, that's, well, uh, our next question comes from, uh, Liana, um, and she writes that our local vet who isn't an avian specialist said she was hesitant to do blood work due to the small size, um, of a white winged parakeet. Um, what sort of blood testing should I ask for when seeing an avian vet? Is it painful for the bird? And how do we make sure that they stay still? Well, um, that's not, um, and who, who asked the question? Liana. Liana, that's not your, your job to make sure that they stay still. That's the veterinarian's job to make sure they stay still. Um, 
That's a good question because when you're talking about parakeets and you're talking about uh, budgies, um, you're looking at 30 gram birds, you're looking at parallettes, you're looking at maybe 20 gram birds. You can only take two tenths of a mil from a 20 gram bird, three tenths of a mil from a budgie. Um, and so when you have some of your smaller birds, uh, it's, it's, you, can only, you can only collect so much blood and, and of course, the more blood that you would like to to take is uh, is is going going to be dependent on how healthy the bird is. So, if you have a, a hundred gram cockatiel, you can only take one mil of blood uh, on a healthy bird. And so, the the collection of blood is is kind of correlated to your experience. And if somebody isn't experienced at, at collecting blood, uh, I like the truthfulness. Um, you should be happy with your veterinarian that they, they um, uh, will tell you this because you don't want somebody collecting blood um, on a smaller patient that doesn't have the experience in, in collecting uh, the blood. Um, if, you, if you need to uh, have a blood sample uh, and you would like to know uh, what the um, condition uh, of the bird is, uh, then possibly they could recommend somebody that would be able to to collect the blood. And you and you may say, well, I live somewhere where I can't. Um, it, if you don't have that information on a sick animal, as you can well imagine, that's going to reduce your ability to. Um, really know how severe the, the disease condition is um, or how well it's being treated. But uh, we collect, uh, and, and, and of course, I have a lot of experience in collecting blood from uh, patients, and it is um, something that we do on parallettes on up and uh, in canaries or what have you. And we, and we utilize that and, and we have the, the, in most diagnostic labs will tell you how much they need and they can run blood samples on that. But um, you have to have somebody that has the, the knowledge, the experience and the confidence to be able to collect the blood. And like I said, it is something that's good where somebody says, hey, I'm, I don't feel comfortable with it. And then that that gives you the opportunity to ask, well, well, can somebody, do you know somebody that, that may be able to do it? Yeah, referral, is it? Right. Uh-huh. Uh, okay, so I have a question from uh, Joanna, and she asks, can you show the most common cause of parrot death in your experience? The most common cause of parrot death in my experience? Well, that's um, a good question. Um, because, um, well, would you, would you attribute to, uh, to disease or trauma? As yeah, I would, I would say, I would say infectious disease. I would say, uh, bacterial, um, fungal, and this would, and, and this would go across, across the, um, across the board, uh, with any of the, um, with any any of the the birds that we treat um it, it's it's infectious disease and and i would say that either bacterial or fungal or viral um that that would be the the most common cause of uh death um in parents. is that something that could be potentially caught during an you know an annual exam those kind of things or? yeah uh <clears throat> you know usually in an annual exam, um, what, what's beneficial about an annual exam is that we learn so much information over the year. Uh, avian medicine is continuing to increase uh, with our knowledge, uh, just like I talked about the Borna, you know, we had the question about the Borna virus. Uh, uh, ten, uh, uh, 15 years ago, we didn't even know about the Borna virus. Um, and, um, proventricular dilatation disease or uh, and so in, in with the nutritional advances with the medical advances 
the annual exam gives you a chance to, to um, actually get more information and learn more uh, about uh, your bird. Um, that's that's the, uh, one of the, the biggest benefits is education and information that, that you should be receiving from your, your medical uh, professional for your bird um, as far, um, uh, and so that's, you know, as far as the, the CBC, yes, the CBC can, uh, in, in particular, uh, can tell you we have had birds, uh, particularly African greys, um, where we, we have a bird that has a fungal infection and the, the, uh, the bird looks normal, but it has a 70,000 white count, okay? So normal is 15, I say, just in general, 15 uh, is a normal mean. And the bird has a 70,000 white count, but if you look at it in the, in the, in the, in the cage, uh, I don't have any, any uh, idea. But I will tell you that um, they say birds um, don't have a, uh, you know, their prey, they, you know, their prey species. And so birds hide their, their, their clinical signs. And um, I, I, I kind of um, am not really, I don't really support that too much. Uh, I, I believe birds show if they're not feeling well. Um, they, they're not going to say, hey, look, I'm sick. Oh, you know, I'm not feeling good. Uh, although they may, but um, if they, uh, you know, if they can vocalize like that. But um, for the most part, a very, a very astute owner, they'll come in and I can look at the bird and, and I'll say, oh, it looks good. And the owner says, Doc, bird's not doing right. Bird's not doing right. It's not, it's not 100% something's wrong with that bird and so birds will will have have clinical signs and usually the clinical signs when you have an infectious disease you will see the clinical signs there will be something there um, but there is the, the 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 very distinct possibility that you would pick up something like in an african gray a uh, 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 an, an abnormal but um, uh, white count that would in, be indicative of an inflammatory response. Um, but that's, again, you also are, while you're doing this on a yearly basis, you get an, uh, an idea of what normal is. So if there is something that is problematic, that you have some history to look back on in the, uh, the files, just like your physician does when you go in for your exam. Good point. Um, this next question comes from Julie. She asks, do you have any suggestions in terms of parrot safe materials for toys? Specifically, do you see any problems with ingestion and GI or respiratory blockages due to paper, plastic, cork, wood, fuzzy fabrics um, such as polar fleece in parrots that you have cared for or read about? Yes. Um kind of all of the above um and so there is no um and and, and i have uh had the uh, uh the, the excellent opportunity to, to to go to a number of bird fairs and and see the toys that are there um there's not a an over uh, oversight committee or association that gives um some type of a parrot seal of approval for safe toys. Um, the, 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 what, I've, uh, what I've noticed is that um, most of the um, uh, toys we've had, uh, some of the cotton, cotton rope, um, um, anything, you, you wanna make sure that you always have parrot specific toys for the size of bird that you have. You don't wanna give your macaw a budgie toy. You don't want it, you know, it so you want to make sure that it's parrot specific. But it it uh, the one thing that you want to be very uh, careful about is is what you provide. And so anything that uh, you want to uh, some of the the wood um, in in is is good. I haven't uh, had any 
issues with um, some of the wood toys. Will birds ingest wood? Yes, they will, but um, that's not something that we normally or commonly see. Um, some of the more problematic um, uh, things that we've had over the years are the ropes, the cotton rope, the soft cotton rope, that the birds will fray and that uh, they will ingest that, that cotton rope and become impacted. Any of the plastics, anything, uh, any plastic, plastic isn't good, I don't believe uh, uh, whatsoever. Um, and uh, for any bird that can chew it. Um, and I think that that could be, you know, again, we've, we've seen that. And of course, you don't want any electronics or anything like that. So you want parrot-specific toys, um, the wood, um, any, anything that they can chew. They like to chew wood. And uh, again, you want to make sure that they have um, something in the, uh, the cage that uh, is psychologically stimulating. And I think that that's, that's, that's good. Um, toys that are made for humans um, aren't, aren't good for parrots. And I've seen where that's been put in and, and made into parrot toys. And, and I think that that's, that's problematic. So you wanna get um, parrot specific, uh, you know, bird specific toys for the size of bird that you have and, and try to maintain that as, as uh, uh, wood um, or in, you know, have blocks and different things like that, that that's very helpful. Well, before I get to the next question, I uh, just wanted to ask, would, would a bird have any clinical sign, like what would be a sign that it's ingested something that's causing a blockage? Would, would it present to the owner in any certain way? Yeah, yeah. Uh, they, they would, they would, uh, they would um, be lethargic. Uh, they would have a depressed attitude and they, they would not be eating. Uh, and so um, that would be, and, and they're not, they're not going to be specific and if there is a blockage they they wouldn't be uh urinating or defecating either um for the most part uh unless there was a partial blockage they may be urinating um they may be urinating but they wouldn't have any fecal material uh within their stool okay um so linda asked um my friend had a two a cockatoo who ate a piece of wood and on necropsy, they found dust in, in his air sac. How common is that? They found what? Dust. Dust? I'm guessing wood dust. Uh, mm. the, the cockatoo ate a piece of wood. Mm -hmm. And on necropsy, they, they discovered dust in his air sac. Is that yeah. um, associated? Or yeah, that wouldn't, be, that wouldn't be common. And like I said, I had mentioned... They will, I know that they will ingest. I know that birds will ingest nest material uh, from the nest box uh, from time to time, but that's uh, highly um, unusual on that. Okay. And I think that and then when you look at it, and cockatoos can tear up some wood, I can tell you that, um, and as most people know, um, that, um, that it, it would be, uh, I think that the risk versus what you're looking at, where you're going to just keep stainless steel things in there, I don't think that that's going to be as uh, beneficial. Okay. okay. Um, Tammy asks, I have a 13-year-old Quaker parrot who weaves skewers in and out of the cage bars. Um, when he was around five years old, his lower beak began overgrowing. I need to take him to the vet once a month to have his lower beak trimmed. Is he healthy, blood work always within, he's healthy, blood work always within normal. So the question is, have you ever seen the lower beak overgrowth before that did not begin right at birth or hatching? <clears throat> yeah, beak, um, beak growth is, is usually uh, related <clears throat> specifically to, to the, um, the normal occlusion of the beak. That's what's going to keep the beak in a normal um, growth pattern, just the normal occlusion. Uh, of course, that they can exercise the beak outside of the normal occlusion, biting different things. And, but you're, it's not like you can put in a beak 
uh, oh, well, this is going to keep the beak lower. So it's normal occlusion. So if you have a bird that is hatched and has has a malalignment of that of the beak, the upper and lower beaks, then what you're going to have is you're going to have abnormal growth rate. Now this can occur later um, when the bird's older, when the bird, <clears throat> if the bird traumatizes the beak some way, um, flies um, into the cage or what have you, um, or uh, it, it flies into the wall or whatever, it can kind of offset the beak a little bit where you don't have the normal occlusion. Um, and so um, one of the issues is that um, usually if the beak fits, uh, the lower beak fits under the upper beak, it'll, it'll, um, it'll keep it short. And, but if it's in front of the beak, of course, it'll, it'll grow longer. Um, they call that prognathism when the, the lower beak's longer um, and so, or, or out in front of the upper beak. And you always want that, of course, the upper beak out there. So that can occur when the bird is in development or this can, and that's usually when, and, and cockatiels and cockatoos have this problem a lot more than other birds where the upper beak's in the lower beak. Um, but uh, for the most part, um, any bird can have it, um, but it's trying to resolve that and otherwise, it, it's probably um, an occlusion, you know, an issue with the occlusion of the beak than the um, anything else. Okay, thank you. Um, so Eileen asks, my crimson bellied conure does not have a producing oil gland. Is there anything I can do? Thanks for your participation, Eileen. Yeah. Um, the, the, um, uh, you know, uh, I'd say, um, you know, is it, um, you know, if it doesn't have a preen gland, um, certain birds don't have preen glands. And so, um, you know, Amazon parrots, for instance, uh, don't have a uropygial gland. Uh, so, uh, with that, um, you know, the, the one thing that I would say is that if you just have it on, on good nutrition, um, that it shouldn't really cause much of an issue. Okay. Uh, let's see if we do have some more questions. Uh, we probably getting a little bit close to the end here, so I'll, I'll see if we have a couple more questions to answer. Well, time uh, flies when you're having fun, Laura. It does. That's a good point. <laughs> yes, it does. Uh, let's see. What no we got pun here. intended, right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, here we go. Stacy asks, there was previously awareness of vaccine towards coronavirus. Where are we with that at the moment? Is this something that is likely to be available in the future? And where are, where are we in the development of a vaccination for the coronavirus? Okay. Um, uh, no, no, and no. How's that? Is that quick? That is to the point, yes. Oh, well, the... the <laughs> No, just for some explanation, um, there's a, uh, a vaccine um, that's available for cytosine beak and feather disease right now, but it's not on the market. To get any vaccine approved takes, um, let's just say, in the neighborhood of, uh, from what I'm to understand, a million to two million dollars to get it approved okay a commercial vaccine you need a company that's going to um, actually um, go through the process to get a vaccine approved and at this point there's no no vaccine that um, i'm aware of for for born a virus um, and i don't know of anybody that's actually um, working on one because um, of the, um, the, I guess, lack of total information we have on the Borna virus and how it's, it, it's involved with proventricular dilatation disease. Um, but even if we had a vaccine and we said, hey, 
proventricular dilatation disease is caused by coronavirus. We need a vaccine right away. The problem is, is that there's not a company out there that would pay the money to actually have it uh, commercially produced because they wouldn't be able to get a return, enough return on their investment for that in the, uh, the uh, pet bird market. And that's why we don't have, when we do have a beak and feather disease um, vaccine, and that's still around, um, available, <clears throat> um, but nobody has the money and will produce it commercially to get it on the market. So that's the predicament we are in um, as pet bird owners. I'm in as a pet bird veterinarian who would love to have a vaccine to prevent some of these uh, disease conditions. We have the, um, I guess, the, the research capabilities to produce these vaccines, but we just don't have the players in place to bring them to market because they don't get enough return. They wouldn't get enough return on that. And that's, that's disheartening uh, for me. Perhaps that's a reason that, um, you know, if, if it is possible to, to contribute to even research, you know, there's yes, some, yes. Some grants out there and stuff that you can find. Mm -hmm. um, all right, this might, I think this is our last question um, from Joanna. She asks, do you know of any case that the parrot beak prosthesis has remained permanently? No, that's a good question. But no, um, and you never know how long a prosthesis, uh, beak prosthesis, will remain in place. Um, <clears throat> the uh, it can it can be it can remain in place for uh, five seconds after the bird recovers to um, a number of months or maybe years. the The problem is is that you have the beak, which is is a very dynamic part of the anatomy and the bird is trying to eat and prehend food and chew food. And, and so what you have is a, um, <clears throat> of course, an inanimate object on viable tissue. And so what happens over time is that this wears and it, as it wears and then it, 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 it over time because pressure is continually being placed on it, then it's going to, it's going to um, displace. And so it's not going to be permanent. Now you can keep reapplying and the bird can do better. Now we have had a number of birds um, that have had their upper beaks just bit off. And so there's nothing there and they just have the lower beak and we have to, to trim it down, but uh, the birds recover and do well on a liquid diet or a, a kind of a, you can either grind up pellets and they'll eat those um, or baby formulas, um, but those birds adjust and adapt well and live just like any other, other bird. And we can guarantee, Laura, that those birds will not bite you. <laughs> but but I but I can tell you is that uh, we place prosthesis on bird beaks, uh, and um, and 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 I know it, it's just something that you can guarantee that they will eventually break down. Hopefully after a long period of time, um, but um, they will. Okay. Okay. Well, I think that would be our last question for today uh, because of the time. But um, just to let our participants know that if, if you did not have your question answered today, um, we will get to that. And uh, hopefully uh, early next week, we'll send you a, an email with your question and an answer. So um, thank you for everyone who, who logged on today. Uh, Dr. Twilley, thank you very, 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 very much for, for being our special guest. Hopefully we'll see you back soon. Um, get back maybe more to some more vet questions because we, we still have a lot that uh, people wanted to people de definitely have questions <laughs> and so appreciate you taking <laughs> the time uh, with us today um, hopefully we'll see you back soon and well, um, thank you thank you and thank just you. <laughs> just to let our viewers know that uh, we will have another webinar next Friday 
uh, and we'll be with Dr. Stephanie Lamb. You might remember her from our first two webinars. And she's going to be covering a pretty timely topic, which is spring is in the air, how to deal with your pet bird's hormonal behavior. So tune in for that. Um, we'll, have an, uh, we'll have that on our website, the information about signing in. And um, just want to thank you, everybody, for participating, everyone for joining us today. So until next time, uh, in the meet, uh, stay healthy, stay safe, and all the best to you and your flock. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Dr. Tully. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Thank you, Lefebvre. Thank you. Yes, thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.